launching of the temporary works flowchart. So what do we want to achieve today? Well, we want to understand the need for temporary works procedures and policies, understand the roles associated with temporary works, understand the requirements of temporary works register and how to, imp to implement it um, correctly, uh, be able to understand and therefore develop a suitable uh, design brief and review designs against it. And we're going to achieve that by discussing some of the requirements that where the, the standard came from historically, running through the new flow chart and also discussing some key requirements of documentation that, that surrounds temporary works. The best place to start is to define temporary works really. And here it is. The new definition in 5975 2019 is quite wordy and does basically encompass everything. <laughs> Uh, but it also lists the types of things which should be considered as temporary works in the standard, which is also quite helpful to it. It kind of lifts them um, in, in, in a summary. The previous version defined uh, is as follows. So it's those parts of the works that allow or enable the construction of, protect or provide the, um, access to the permanent works and which might or might not remain in place at the completion of the works. This is a slightly more succinct definition, but it also does encompass a lot but folks that's because the scope of what temporary works is is extremely extensive by its nature so let's let's have a look at what that means in reality we have our friend uh, wally down here who's going to help us spot some temporary works over these next few photos so first we have a uh, quite a simple site really um we've got uh, some hoarding uh, gates piling platforms or working platforms temporary stockpiles uh, which is probably overkill in this situation, but for larger stockpiles, the temporary stability is often a consideration. And also the, an assessment of the existing structures in the temporary condition, which is over in the corner on the left-hand side. Um, if it's not, if it's changing from its current state to a temporary state to a permanent state, that needs to be considered. The middle photo is of a complex basement redevelopment scheme in Manchester. As such, there are many temporary works here that were associated with this scheme, including hoarding, temporary works access platforms, tower cranes and associated foundations, basement propping and the interface with the new and the existing structure, the structure in its temporary condition again, um, excavations, formwork, false work, just you know, to mention a few items. The last photo on the right is of a bridge replacement scheme in Upper Holloway. Um, crane position, including checking the existing structure. Rebar stability, uh, assessment of the cage in the temporary condition during the transport and while it's being lifted. Temporary stability of the bridge itself when the deck's demolished. And also the excavation stability around the areas, as you can see there that with that batter. The level of complexity determines how much attention we need to pay to the temporary works. What might be a simple hoarding on one site may well become something that requires a lot of thought if it is placed directly adjacent to a steep batter, for example. Many people uh, you speak to uh, see temporary works as almost something that we worry about a bit too much. Um, I'm going to run through the history behind why we have these procedures we do today and why temporary works can become a problem if um, if it isn't given the due consideration and planning that it deserves and also why they must be designed and installed properly. So if we go back to 1909 in Newport Dock, here we have a photo of what was left after the collapse of a large excavation support system failure. It's an earthworks failure, 38 were killed, uh, but we don't actually know if this figure is accurate as they did not have the same registers, registers that we do today on, on who was at site at the time. Uh, this is the earliest temporary works failure that is, is uh, usually referenced and recognised as, as such. This next one is Loddon Viaduct, a bridge just outside Reading. It's the construction of um, one highway bridge in each direction, which would which was slightly separate from each other. And during the construction of one of the bridges, the false work failed, leading to a massive collapse. Three were killed during this incident, which was more by luck. Um, as it happened on a lunch break, and they, they had staggered breaks, so there was a reduced number of people on site. 
Also, there are references from those on site at the time who said that they felt a slump in the deck just before the support gave way, and some were able to jump safely across to the newly constructed bridge just adjacent. Um, and that you can see here is just quite astounding reading on the case study, really. And another classic example of temporary works failure was the M60 Barton Bridge or viaduct, um, where they uh, had a failure and there was three fatalities. This was quite a high profile disaster uh, that was also discussed in, in Parliament. And interestingly, um, in, the, in this photo, in the background here, you can see the M60 Barton Bridge on the left hand side there. And you can see a new bridge that was being constructed on the shipping canal um, in 2016. This is a photo of the new bridge, uh, the lift bridge that collapsed during commissioning and we were called in to assist once it had gone a bit pear shaped as when the deck fell it caused significant damage and to the structure and also got wedged as you can see here it's just, it's quite uh, interesting how they were very close to each other and both large temporary works failures. So during the 50s, 60s and 70s there were a number of large scale collapses that were the result of poorly planned temporary works. This led to industry leaders sitting up and thinking that we must do something to tackle this issue. This led to the Bragg report, which reviewed the failings in the construction industry as it was and identified a number of recommendations. Most of these recommendations were incorporated into the British standard of the temporary works. And I have um, listed some key ones here. So we've got Horizontal loads, um, looking at lateral stability or minimal lateral stability of structures, lacing and bracing, the use of proprietary equipment and their instructions of use, uh, management and procedural control of temporary works is a, a key one. In fact, a large portion of um, 5975 is dedicated to how temporary works should be managed on site and what procedures should be in place to help reduce errors and also have the best chance of spotting them before they lead to a potential failure. The importance of design briefs. Uh, this is especially prevalent now that temporary works is commonly carried out by engineers that are not based on site. Therefore, the brief should identify interfaces that may not be clear to somebody not familiar with the site who may be designing your temporary works. The introduction of one individual, I like this one. So the introduction of one individual who um, uh, within the org construction organisation that has the duty of ensuring that all relevant procedures and checks are carried out and such individual being known as the temporary works coordinator. Uh, that role was introduced in the Bragg report. And it's also worth mentioning at this time as well that the publication of this report um, that the construction industry was very different to what it is now. Um, health and safety legislation was beginning to bring improvements onto site um, and there was little subcontracting of construction work with most trades being carried out by the main contractors oper operatives but now most construction work is subcontracted away from the principal contractor which is why the CDM regulations play a key role in ensuring the duty holders are competent and those appointed plan manage and monitor their work i.e in this case plan manage and monitor temporary works. Even with modern guidance and training and awareness, we're still getting large collapses from structures that are associated with temporary works. Florida Bridge collapse. Um, the report on this one makes some quite worrying reading. Uh, it's well worth tracking down and reading if you get a chance. It identified that there were not only design errors, but how a lack of action on site could carry on until the bridge uh, collapsed. Uh, this was in America who don't use 5975, but it, it still shows how a large scale disaster can still occur in modern day. Gerard's Cross is the next one on the right. Um, that's in 2005. That was the collapse of some precast segmental arches. This structure collapsed onto a railway, you can see there, during construction, whilst it was being backfilled each side of the arch. Luckily, nobody was killed and there was no trains there at the time. Another couple of large scale temporary works failures here, including uh, Didcut power station collapse in 2016 on the right there. This one in particular was a, a, an eye opener for the industry and, and brings to the fore the magnitude of risk that can be associated with, with temporary works. So how, how do we do better? Well, 
in summary, there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, we should be striving to do our best and not resting on our laurels, thinking that legislation will do all the work for us. Even with the procedures we have to date, as well as the current practices, I believe that as an industry, we can really crack down on the number of these types of instances that I've, I've mentioned. And I believe a key part of that solution is temporary works awareness, which is something that I'm very passionate about, hence my efforts to speak to you today. Um, but another key part of the solution um, is better understanding of the, the best practice uh, and following the British standards that, that laid down and, and what we must do to properly control temporary works. Um, and that's why we've put together a temporary works flowchart back in the beginning of uh, 2017 and how, why we've since amended it to the shiny new edition that incorporates the new revisions to BS 5975 2019. And I really I thank all those present on this webinar because this joint industry learning um, is really going to make, make a difference. So now on to the standard itself and, and what are the main changes from the previous version of 5975 to the new one? Well, don't worry, it's not changed all that much. It's a revision on section one and two of the British standard with section three on permissible stress design of the false, false work remaining unchanged. There's more information on roles and the links between them. Information on procedures that clients, permanent works designers and temporary works designers can adopt is provided, whereas the previous code was focused on contractors only. It has expanded on situations on large scale sites to include multiple temporary works coordinators and how they react and interact with one another, introducing the PCs TWC, which is the principal contractors temporary works coordinator who is essentially the main man on temporary works he's the, he's the lead temporary works coordinator for the project also recognizing that some sites such as large motorway schemes they don't really lend themselves to having one lead temporary works coordinator and it discusses specific measures that should be taken to clearly identify responsibilities of area segregation there are also some helpful diagrams on, on um, lines of responsibilities for many different um, contract arrangements. Um, and it's also been updated to incorporate the CDM regulations 2015, um, particularly with respect to the interface between the design of permanent works and the design of temporary works. The implementation plan and implementation risk is another new addition. This is not the same as the risk category for checking with CAT 0, 1, 2 and 3. It's, it's totally different. So the implementation plan is produced by the TWC and consists of the documents and items listed here. Uh, but the key thing is it includes the implementation risk class, which is shown in, in table one here. So the implementation risk class is to do with the combined risk of execution risk and consequence of failure risk. These risks um, are to do with the competency of the contractor erecting the works or the workmanship, as well as the location of the temporary works and site constraints. As such, the implementation risk for the same temporary works in two different locations or constructed by two different contractors, that can vary greatly. The implementation class risk should be used to determine who can permit uh, sign off permits, um, to load and strike and should also be a gauge as to what the category check should be carried out, i.e. the CAT 1, 2 or 3. But note, the implementation risk is totally independent of the um, of that, that check category. They're two separate items. Um, and they're the main changes in a, a brief summary. So overall, the general procedure and aim has not changed dramatically um, as it's still aims to create procedures that minimize the chance of errors being made and maximize the chance of errors being discovered uh, if they are made. Also to ensure that um, there's effective communication of information and, and the requirements between all levels of the construction organization involved so that we're all talking to each other and communicating and essentially trying to present, prevent something like this becoming something like this. So now I'm going to run through the flow chart um, and talk you through the process step by step. This is the moment you've all been waiting for, I, I suspect. So I'm going to be focusing. Uh, so this is a kind of a snapshot of the, the rough um, flow chart that I've got here. I've used the bare bones, really. 
I'm going to be focusing on the left hand side, which covers the principal contractor side as uh, that was broadly similar to the process for the managing contractor and subcontractor. However, please know that the information that's shown on the left hand side on that flow chart is not repeated again on the right. There is additional information shown that's relevant to the temporary works coordinator and temporary work supervisor roles. But when you get this chart, just take this into account. A much prettier version than I'm using uh, will be available to you good people. I've just used the bare bones. Um, it will, as Chris mentioned, it will be free as a download and hard copies can also be purchased. But I just want to make clear that we're not planning on making any profit on this. This is just to cover costs and anything left uh, will go to charity. I um, believe they're gonna be sent out in, uh, we're planning on sending them out in A0 size um, because there's a lot of detail on there and they probably need to be that big put up on your site cabin wall or whatever. So you, you don't have to carry a magnifying glass around with you to, to look at some of the notes on there. So let's begin and let's start at the top. Every contractor should have a designated individual or DI if they're controlling temporary works. This first stage is the appointment of the principal contractor's designated individual or the PCDI. They will take responsibility and they cannot pass it on. They are essentially in the firing line and are the person who says whether someone is competent and makes the relevant appointments of the other roles required to control the temporary work, such as um, temporary works coordinator and the temporary work supervisor or TWC and TWS. The DI is generally someone with a background in engineering at a high level within a company, usually directly responsible to a board of directors or on the board of directors. The project uh, can then commence and the lead TWC, known as the PC TWC, the Principal Contractors Temporary Works Coordinator, is then appointed. Note that where I reference um, any action made by the PC TWC or TWC, it does not mean that they have to do the work personally. They may delegate their role as defined by the Temporary Works Procedure. Um, however, they retain the responsibility for that task. It may be the TWS, TWS or the admin assistant or TWC employed by another organization who undertakes that work. It's very important that the TWC accepts the role as well as the responsibilities that come with it in uh, writing. It should be recorded in writing on usually like a letter headed um, document, which clearly defines the remit of this particular TWC. This becomes more prevalent on larger sites and projects where multiple temporary works coordinators are required. Because if this is the case, then it's very important that limits are clearly defined because an interface gap between roles will only ever bring bad news. The level of competence of a temporary works coordinator is also very important. There are sites that I've been on uh, where the temporary works coordinator is uh, an unsuitable site manager who does not have the appreciation of temporary works and thus a bad situation arise. The temporary works coordinator must be a competent person who has training, experience, and must have the authority to exercise their duties, which may, uh, may include halting work if they deem the, the works unsatisfactory. The temporary works coordinator may require um, temporary works supervisors or, or TWSs to assist in carrying out the duties, but remember, can delegate the work, but never the responsibility. It is the responsibility of the temporary works coordinator to ensure his duties are carried out. Whether he actually does them or not, as I've covered, is a different matter. In most cases, though, it's prudent that the temporary works coordinator carries out most of the duties, i.e. reviewing method statements, uh, just to ensure that they have a good and sound understanding of, of the tasks that are, be, uh, that are being carried out on site. The temporary works coordinator will prepare a temporary works register which is a live document and used to identify track and control temporary works. Uh, Dave's gonna discuss this document um, a little bit later. Um, the temporary works coordinator also needs to ensure that a design brief is prepared and not to write it themselves, but to ensure it's there and it's suitable. The brief should be commensurate with the complexity of the design and Dave will discuss this a little bit later on as well. But note that responsibility lies with the TWC and the designer to use their competence to establish how extensive the design brief should be and also what level of category check uh, must be taken 
due, uh, well, taken due consideration of the implementation risk that, that I mentioned earlier as well. So now here's when um, we at Andon usually come in. So the design team is selected and a lead temporary works designer is appointed if, if required. This is only required where there are multiple design organizations on, on temporary work schemes. Then the design brief is issued to the designer and the designer then carries on and with the design and, and produces the scheme. On more complex designs, we have often uh, produced a uh, concept design or a sneak peek of the design to our, our clients. Uh, from experience, this provides a more collaborative approach to finding the right solution that works for both the client and the designer. So this, this single box, which we've shown here, can be drawn out a little more, but it essentially covers the, the design stage. The next formal stage is the review of the design by the TWC. During this stage, it is important that the TWC reviews it against the brief and ensures that it conforms with the brief. If it doesn't, then uh, feed back to the designer with a sense of, well, this wasn't what I asked for. Uh, similarly to buying a new sofa and a, and a wooden chair turning up, you think, oh, that's not what I ordered. That's, that's not what I put down on the requirements. So provide this feedback to the designer and, and make sure the design fits the brief. Um, it is genuinely uh, great for us to get feedback from our, our clients and to find out if what we had envisaged, envisioned and uh, designed did the job it was meant to do. Uh, this is how we all get better at what we do with constructive feedback um, holding the most value in, in my opinion. Um, so at this stage, um, the temporary works, once he's reviewed it, the temporary works coordinator will issue the design to, um, if necessary, to the principal designer, the client or the permanent works designer for review uh, where appropriate. This enables the relevant parties to comment on the scheme and from experience it has been very helpful, especially for uh, multidisciplinary checks across the scheme. However, taking a red pen to calculations and point scoring really isn't helpful. The, the main aim of this process uh, of, the, of this particular step is, is to review the concept of the design and its philosophy and considering it and, and coming, commenting upon it. You know, that, that's really the, the aim behind this that stage. So once that stage is done, uh, now the level of check can be confirmed and the design principle um, approved. The design can then be sent to the checker. For some designs, the check level may um, be cat zero or, or cat one, um, in which case it will have probably already been checked uh, as the package sent straight to the TWC. Um, this is because it's common practice for all designs to receive a cat one but review before anything is, is issued outside the company, much like we do at, at Andon. But if it's going to be cat two or three check, then it's prudent that um, to have a review with the site team as well uh, for them to comment. It's not uncommon for tweaks to be made at this stage. For example, the preferred supplier of a propping system may need to be changed if, if the contractor is finding a particular system difficult to procure. Um, and now we have the uh, design check. <clears throat> I'm briefly gonna go over the check categories as, as there's usually some confusion on, on the difference. Um, so cat zero, that's standard solutions only, trench boxes. Uh, someone says, I want to use this after consulting with the manufacturer's guidance. Someone else says he looks at the or she looks at the guidance and says, yeah, that, that looks OK. And these are usually decided on site for low risk standard solutions. Cat one, this covers simple designs, pile mats, um, heras fences, hoardings within site. There should still be a design carried out, i.e. calculations and drawings, but this may be checked by somebody else within the design team in the same company. Cat two, more complex designs. The majority of our work comes under this category and it is for more involved designs that may carry a higher risk. The check should be carried out by somebody not involved in the, in the design, but works for the same company. The checker receives the design drawings and the information used for the design only. They should not see the design calculations. And in fact, according to 5975 2019, the calculations themselves are not classed as a design output. Although um, many clients do still insist that they are issued as part of the design package. The checker in this case effectively does the design again from scratch 
and hopefully comes up with the same answer. Even with this well-documented process and, and tables in the, the relevant standards, we do still see design calculations come back with lots of comments from engineers who have supposedly done a CAT3 check. This is wrong and it's not an independent design check. Category three, this is for more complex or innovative designs of high level or high risk. Network Rail often stipulates that all designs adjacent to railway is, is CAT3 due to the risk of their assets. This comes back to the implementation risk that we've just covered, but the check is essentially the same as a CAT2, but the checker works for an independent organization. Sometimes the checker may have some comments on the design, which usually forms as a, a schedule of queries, which can be discussed between the TWC, the designer and the checker. Um, note that the design can change at this point, should the checker pick up on an error. But remember that this is all part of the design and check process and, and catching errors before construction. So now that the queries are resolved and the check is complete and issued to the TWC, it may be that some further external approvals may be required. And these could be in the form of an AIP for highways or a form 23 submission uh, for network rail. So that at this stage, that that's when th this, those are usually um, dealt with and approved. The next step is that the TWC will usually brief the design team on the design, its limitations and any guidance notes. On high risk or complex schemes, it's recommended that the designer is involved in that briefing um, because they know the design inside out, swinging from a light bulb, they'll be able to highlight particular items which are very important. If there is a note on a drawing um, or a limitation on the design that you, you don't understand or, or is picked up, the TDBC isn't quite clear, then the, the best thing that you can do is, is speak to the designer there will be a reason why a particular note has been added and they're usually added for, for good reason. One of our standard notes in our drawings is um, to, it says, if in doubt, ask. Um, and it's because it's much safer to ask a question than it is to make an assumption. The method statement is then produced, incorporating the relevant points of the um, temporary works design. And then that should be approved by the, the temporary works coordinator. Now, an inspection test plan and appropriate quality control checklist are produced and followed, uh, that's followed by a implementation plan. And these are specific documents that may be uh, minimal, but they can be very important on high risk complex jobs. Uh, these are uh, produced by the TWC. Then we're on to the construction stage. Um, the temporary works are delivered and constructed. The TWC will inspect the temporary works to ensure compliance with the design. If there is a discrepancy, then it's vital that the TWC has a discussion with the designer. Um, we, and I'd say we're quite accommodating. And if what has been built works and upholds the philosophy of the design, then that's great. In our opinion, fantastic. Rock on, Tommy. You can crack on and, and we're happy with that. But if the reality is different to the design and that, process isn't approved by the designer, then the TWC is essentially taking on a, a lot of risk and will be in danger of taking on the kind of designer role in the eyes of CDM regulations if it is signed off. So be very, very careful in this um, scenario. Once the TWC is satisfied with um, that the as built temporary works um, is in accordance with the design and that's been approved, then a permit to load can be signed effectively bringing the, the temporary works into use. Regular inspections will also be required and these should be undertaken by a regular person. Now, when the temporary works have done their job and are no longer required, then they can be removed. A permit to dismantle should then be produced and sometimes um, the removal sequence, it's worth noting, can be more or sometimes more complex than the erection. So an awful lot may have changed since the temporary works were constructed. So a specific dismantling sequence may be required from the designer. It's sometimes the case that once they, the temporary works have done the job and they're in the way and everyone is in a rush to get the gear down and get it shipped out, um, 
usually this is the kind of situation when something goes awry. So be careful of this and, and don't get caught out. Um, once they're dismantled, uh, it's job complete really. So at this stage, it's a good idea to provide any feedback and reflect on lessons learned um, as this can be a benefit to both the contractor and, and also the designer too. So that, that's the general procedure in a nutshell really. As, as mentioned, these flowcharts will be issued as um, a downloadable PDF to uh, all those attending and um, will be available for purchase as well. So I'm now going to hand over to Dave, who's going to run through uh, a couple of other points regarding um, the procedures, temporary works role and some documentation as well. Yep. Thanks, Josh. So what I'm going to run through here really is kind of a designer's perspective on the temporary works coordinator's role. So temporary works coordinator role has a lot of um, a lot of responsibilities. There's a massive list in 5975, but I'm just going to have a look at just the sections which really affect the designer and from our point of view are very important to carrying out their role effectively. So temporary works coordinators obviously drive what happens on site and they massively affect how successful a project is going to be. So how they carry out their job is, is very important to us as designers and what they provide us really affects what's going to be completed. So in general, their role, Josh has covered a lot of this, is to coordinate between permanent works designers, temporary works designers, contractors, people on site, to gather all the information required for the temporary works design, to kind of collate that, allow the designs to be completed, and then make sure those designs are carried out on site. So there is no responsibility as a temporary works coordinator to do any design work. It's um, it's not part of their role, but if they are competent to do it, they can do it. It's, but it isn't. It's not part and parcel of what they do. They hold the records of all the temporary works carried out on site, and they carry out the inspections, the permits to loads, and things Josh has just gone through in the um, in the um, flowchart. But from a designer's point of view, the three things that they do, which are really important to us, is they do or they establish and maintain the temporary works register, which is a live document. This has to be kind of kept up to date with designs coming in and new stuff developing on site. They prepare the design briefs for the designers to carry out the work. These are very important documents. They affect everything we do and a poor design brief is gonna result in a poor design, unfortunately. Uh, we can request information, but if the time is put in at the start to get the right design brief out, that's gonna help us massively. And the final thing, and you'd think this is really obvious, but changes on site need to be communicated to designers. So if we don't, we are not a site-based role. If we don't know what's happening or if there's a change to the permanent works and it's not communicated, then the design that we're completing isn't gonna be particularly useful to the guys on site. So they're the three main things. I'm gonna quickly focus on the temporary works register now, if Josh hits the button. So, Temporary works register. So what should this do? This is completed at the start of the task or start of the project and should outline what temporary works are required. Obviously these develop as the project progresses. Not everything can be foreseen at the start, but what data should be kind of kept on here is a list of essentially what, what is needed. When design briefs are issued, the dates they're issued and their references, and when designs are required to be completed to allow the project to carry on as, as planned. You should also be keeping things like the check category, completion dates, any permits to load references, everything can go onto this spreadsheet. It's normally a spreadsheet. They're normally kind of dictated by the companies involved, but there's a lot of information on here. And if this is kept up to date and accurate, then it's going to help the designers by giving us the appropriate amount of time to carry out our designs and checks. This will also highlight with third party approvals, getting approval from network rail or AIPs, highways, takes a long time generally, and highlighting when you need to get these designs carried out to get these approvals in place is, is only gonna help your project, otherwise delays are gonna be kind of taken in. So it's a common saying that temporary works are always the last things considered and the first things required on site so it's we really need to try and be better on how we plan these and how we get the information across to the designers to do 
job in the appropriate amount of time. Rush jobs are never going to be the best solutions. So that's kind of where we sit there. So the design brief is kind of shows us this is what the temporary works coordinator produces to allow the designer to do their job. So along with the obvious things, which is essentially what you want designing, category of checks, that kind of stuff. The things to be thinking about when completing these or producing these is what additional information you need to give the designers. So permanent works drawings that are relevant to that section. If you're looking at demolition side, historical drawings, any kind of opening up works and site investigations, they are all very, very useful information. The more information that you provide, the better it is going to be as long as it is relevant. The other things to think about are, as we've talked about before, compliance. Uh, is this close to railways? Are there, are there any additional hazards involved? What kind of approvals are going to be required? It should give a required date for the design to be completed, which is quite often missed out. And kind of having a think about the construction sequence. If propping is to be installed, then what's going to be then constructed around it? How is it going to be removed? A kind of a brief sequence of how the temporary, work co temporary works coordinator sees the works happening can be a huge benefit to the designer so that we design something that is relevant to the project. Just saying we need some propping here doesn't really help us hugely. Uh, a bit of information on like equipment required. If you've got, if you prefer to go down the line of like fabricated steelwork, proprietary equipment, this can save us a lot of time and saves us a conversation down the line with what you need. So that kind of things. And yeah, any other high risk or any other hazards to the um, the project that you can see from your point on site. So that's kind of an overview of the additional things to think about when completing a design brief beyond the obvious of what is needed. So the final thing I was just going to run through is the design check certificate. So this is uh, this is what's required after a project's been completed and needs to be recorded in the temporary works register. So the TWC has a record that the design has been done. These are carried out by the designers and the appropriate checkers. So as Josh already outlined, you've got all the categories of check that are required. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory. The designer signs one half, the checker signs the other half. The other things the TWC should be reviewing are like kind of RAMs and method statements, um, which are there. And then as we mentioned briefly at the end, kind of recording feedback on the project. So as a, an industry, we're very bad at learning. Um, but if a project's gone well, please feed back the good bits. If projects have gone poorly, then I'm sure you will have fed things back. But let's try and learn and be better at what we do, because it definitely needs to improve. And I think that brings us to the end of our, our presentation. So I think we're going to be moving on to questions and answers. Yes, thanks. Thanks, Dave. Just uh, quickly before we move on to that, it's just uh, if you'd like to know some more about the subject, um, there's a wealth of information on the Temporary Works Forum. The website's noted here. There's a great book published by the ICE called Temporary Works Principles of Design and Construction. There's lots of helpful information in, in this one. There's also the um, British Standard itself, BS5975, 2019. But also uh, all the other webinars that we've hosted, which is on our YouTube channel. So you just type in and and into the YouTube search bar and hey, presto, you've got yourself a bona fide immersive experience in the world of temporary works right there. Um, so I recommend you get onto there and check those out. So yes, now time for a quick break. I'm going to um, stop speaking for a little while and uh i'll stop sharing and we can pick up some questions no thanks um thanks josh and typically given uh how we've been running these webinars just as i'm about to speak again a a big tanker has just parked outside my window and so if you hear any noise in the background uh that's what that is so um yeah, I'm, uh, I just again want to thank, um, this is our anniversary um, webinar, thank all the people that have um, come and spoken on these. Uh, we've had uh, obviously David Thomas from the TWF, who you mentioned in your resource, is always a great resource for more temporary works knowledge. I know they have a raft of resources 
um, and doing great things to support the, the community. Uh, we've also, uh, I noticed we have Rafe Philippe who's on the on the call again today, and um, yeah, just thank him for coming, sharing his um, expertise around the procedural control of of temporary works. And we've also had Malachi and Jordan and Eddie and, and Arafa with people cut and Steve from Network Rail come and join us and share those those different pieces. I wanted to take a second to to thank. Uh, then the the other thing um, I wanted to say was just um, uh, and then you know we've been uh, growing steadily over the the years um, and continue to to do so. So we are always on the the lookout for talented engineers that are um, and Josh maybe put the talented but in talented engineers that um, are you know looking looking to to become more immersed in in temporary works. And hopefully now um, I was given Josh, uh, my, my rambling has given Josh a couple of seconds just to have a look at the, the questions. Now we do have 